This podcast features criminologists discussing sensitive themes and topics. Listener discretion is advised. A woman's sense of betrayal leads to one of the most devastating crimes in Kuwaiti history. This is the Nasra Alanezi story. Hi, Amy. Hey, Megan. How are you doing today? I'm good. And hello to our listeners and viewers. Today's case is one that I'm pretty sure you haven't heard of, but it brings us to Kuwait, a small but well-known country located in the Middle East. Have have we ever covered a case from there? No. So we have a number of international listeners, and we have both covered a number of international cases. Amy, I know that you've picked some really interesting cases from Australia, Japan, Canada, mm-hmm. and other countries. Yep. Um, I know that I've handled ones from South Africa, also Australia, and England. Mm-hmm. But today is definitely our first case from Kuwait. I don't know about you too, but what I love about these cases outside of the United States is that I learned so much about the legal systems of other countries. And because for me, and I think similar to you, our forte is really American criminology, This is, it makes it even more interesting for us to do kind of the comparative criminology. Today's case is certainly tragic, but one I learned so much from. And certainly at the end of this case, we welcome our audience feedback and discussion. And there are some very significant issues that we're going to cover today. And I feel like we're going to have some real um, differing, possibly, opinions on today's case. So before we meet the subject of today's episode, I just want to briefly give everyone a little bit of a background on Kuwait, for those who don't know. As I said, Kuwait's a very small country. Its total population is only about 4 million people, which is less than the state of New Jersey where you live, Amy, just for reference. I don't think I realized it was such a small country. You know, you know it's small, but when you hear the numbers, it definitely puts it in a different context. Mm -hmm. Even though it's so small, it's one of the wealthiest countries due to its access to the richest oil reserves in the world. Kuwait has a desert climate with temperatures rising to about 120 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer months. So it can be very hot there. Mm -hmm. In addition, Kuwait nationals are mostly Muslim and Arabic, so much so uh, that I learned in this episode in 1981, the government passed a law limiting citizenship to Muslims wanting to come to Kuwait because of the lack of diversity in Kuwait, which was very interesting. That is interesting. Most of Kuwait's population is located within Kuwait City, the country's capital. And that is where 23-year-old Nazra Youssef Elanezi, the subject of today's episode, lived with her 36-year-old husband, Zaid Zafria, in 2009. So the pair married when Nasra was in her late teens and her husband was in his 30s. But not much else is known from what I could find about Nasra's childhood or what her family life was like before she married her husband, Zaid. When you say late teens, was she 18 at least? Yes, yes, I believe so. She was around okay. 18 or 19. So, so it wasn't, yes. okay. And I don't know what the laws of consent are in that country anyway, but. Right. She was in her late teens, though. We, you know, okay. I don't think that the age is much up for dispute. I mean, although culturally, okay. we might look at that very differently, right, in the United States. Mm-hmm. But it was also permissible and legal, um, their marriage. So while we don't know much about the background of Nasra, we do know for the first few years of their marriage, Nasra and Zaid were pretty happy by all accounts. They lived a happy life together. Uh, he worked outside of the home and Nasra was a stay-at-home mother. She was very young. The couple had two children, Shaka and Muhammad. However, in 2009, when Shaka was three years old and Muhammad was five, home life was proving to be a little bit harder for Nasra, as it had been revealed that both of the children had developed special needs. I'm not sure what those special needs are and to what extent this is what's reported. But Nasra found herself at this time, Amy, at home alone, trying to meet complicated child care for her children. And, you know, she was young, in her early 20s. 
Now, a few sources also reported that Nasra herself had some mental health issues when she was a child, though it's not clear what those issues were or to what extent. It was hard to find information on this case, even though I think it's very important. There were people that stated that Nasra could be impulsive and erratic, and they observed that in her teens. One might say that I mean, most teens, <laughs> most teens are impulsive and erratic. No, that's what I was going to say. One might say that. Right. She's a teenager um, who yeah. was put into a marriage at a pretty young age. However, and also Kuwait's not a country that um, I would say has the strongest advocacy for mental health assistance. So I didn't find any evidence that Nasra sought any medical or, or psychiatric attention for any of these issues. So it's possible that mental health issues may have also contributed to Nasra feeling very overwhelmed and a bit unstable as she tried to care for these children with her husband mostly not around and without a strong support system from what I could see. As far as you know, she didn't have family members close by. I really couldn't find that, but it didn't seem that people were helping her in the home. It seemed that she was mostly on her own with the two children and feeling overwhelmed. I'm not saying she didn't have a family support system, but I couldn't find any assistance that she received. Mm -hmm. Allegedly, this started to cause some problems, though, because Saeed didn't believe that Nazra should be so stressed taking care of their children. I'm not sure also to what degree it may have upset him that the children had special needs. But with some of these issues, some of the problems that began to erupt after a couple of years, uh, Zaid began searching for a new wife. Unbeknownst to his current wife? No. It was known to Nasra that, she, that he was looking for a new wife because this is a common practice for Muslim families I in was Kuwait. Gonna, okay. Okay. So this is culturally appropriate. Yes. Polygamy is legal and considered appropriate. Culturally, it's believed okay. that among Kuwaiti people that the more wives you have, the more respected you are in the community and the further... Respect is gained by continuing your lineage. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't planning on divorcing his current wife. He was no. just planning on bringing another woman into the home. That's okay. correct. As I said, polygamy was legal, illegal. And no, he was not planning on divorcing Nasra. Okay. The process of finding a new wife takes time. I learned this because it's usually done by a matchmaker. What happens is the matchmaker gathers the names of eligible young women, presents them to the man, and then the man chooses which woman he would like to marry. Is that how he is that how the two of them initially met? Likely so. Yes, that is the most common okay. practice. Now, I keep saying common practice just because it is. That doesn't mean that everyone involved was so accepting of this custom. Right. Nasra mm -hmm. certainly wasn't. Later on, she stated that she did not like at all that her husband was uh, not at home, that he was meeting with matchmakers to find a new wife. I think he had already been at work a lot as well. But Nasra felt abandoned by him, even though it was not seen as a marital infraction in their society. She saw it as an act of infidelity. And culturally, we can understand that because here we mostly would view that also as an act of mm -hmm. infidelity. Nasra struggled with the idea of losing her husband to another woman, but she mostly kept those concerns to herself. Reportedly, Nasr's friends and family said that she didn't confide in most of them about how she was feeling. We don't know if she confided in her husband or if this was maybe not appropriate as well. Either way, in August of 2009, much to Nasr's dismay, Zaid announced that he had found a new wife. Now, since courting is not common practice in Kuwaiti culture, the pair set their date to be married on August 15th, 2009. So this is just two weeks after their initial announcement, which means that Nazra and others don't really have time to adjust to this idea. It happens very quickly. Zaid's new bride uh, is not named in any sources, probably due to privacy reasons, um, just so you know, so we won't be using her name. But with the announcement made, the pair, their wedding, would be held in Al Jahara, which was a smaller city to the west of Kuwait City. Is it common practice for the first wife to be in attendance at the wedding? That's interesting. I don't I don't know that it is, but I don't believe it is. Um, I don't believe Nazar okay. was invited to this wedding as well. Okay. Just so you know. But do you know anything about Kuwaiti weddings? Probably not. Right? No, I don't. 
No, I'd love to hear it, though. They are extravagant affairs, much like many weddings okay. in the U.S. are. A lot of money is put into them. They have very fancy food, foreign performers, beautiful, shiny decorations. They're very kind of prestigious. And Zaid and his new bride spared no expense on their wedding. Zaid had means. One big difference, though, between U.S. and Kuwaiti weddings is that at the wedding reception, Amy, the men and women celebrate in separate rooms or tents. So my brother is Orthodox, and at his wedding, the men and women also celebrate separate. Okay, well, what is the reason? Oh, I don't, you know, me, I'm, I don't know much about religion. Okay. I'm not sure what the reason is. Okay, for... um, But I... I'm assuming it's a similar reason to what you're going to tell me. So I'm I would curious. think so. It's in Kuwaiti culture, from what I read, um, it's so that women can relax and enjoy themselves by removing their headscarves and face coverings since oh. they're not in the presence of men. And so it's not That's against religion or custom. That's very interesting. So it's done almost as a way. Um, it, it's it's a way to make the women. It's it's helpful for for the women. Yes, it is. That's very interesting. Yes, it is. I like that. I don't believe it's like, I don't think that's the reason because the women who wear, you know, head coverings mm -hmm. in the Orthodox religion, they don't take it off at the wedding, oh. even when they're separate. Okay. You're going to have to find out about that and get back to us. Yes, I am curious. So Zaid and his new bride, they adhered to this custom, renting enormous tents that could hold hundreds of people. They had one tent, as I said, with women, uh, with the women, it's, it's women and children. And the other tent mm -hmm. holds the men. That's not fair that the men get to party and not have to worry about the kids. Of course. Yeah, it's not fair at all. Um, but no. it is the way it is. The wedding yeah. proceeded. And at first it was a grand and wonderful event. How could it not be from what I described? Family and friends of the bride and groom danced, ate and celebrated throughout the evening. But this was tragically, this celebration was tragically cut short around 9 p.m. when a fire ripped through the women and children's tent. And Amy, this tragedy immediately turned deadly as these tents were not up to code. The reason they weren't up to code or the way they were not up to code was that there was only one exit in and out. They were supposed to have multiple in and out exits. And so when the fire took hold, a stampede ensued, which made for absolutely devastating consequences. So this is a cover tent. I was picturing it as, you know, like a wedding in the United States. It would just be a tent, but you can walk through kind of. This sounds like this is an no. enclosed tent. Totally enclosed a... tent. Yes. Remember, the women and okay. the, the women have to be kind of, I, I don't want to say no one hidden, can see them. but yeah. they are protected. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. It is for privacy. Okay. So within minutes, the tent was completely engulfed in flames with temperatures inside of the tent reaching 930 degrees Fahrenheit. A side note here, it was already over 100 degrees that day in Kuwait. How many people were in the tent? About hundreds, a couple hundred. Hundred. With only wow. one exit and smoke and fire everywhere, 41 women and children were killed instantly due to the flames. Six I'm assuming that the fire department was called, but they got there too late yes, to yes. save everyone. The fire was immediate. Wow. And mm -hmm. I will say, yes, emergency services responded. People were taken to the hospital, but 16 later died from their injuries, bringing the total death count to 57 people that day, along with 90 more who were injured. Wow. That's why I said this is one of the biggest disasters. Um, and Kuwait's I'm assuming seen. that's why this case, this case probably made international news. Yes. Because and it is so yes, tremendous. And it did, but not huge, not huge news. Yes, I could find information, but still not everywhere. Um, and some of the sources were not necessarily the ones we would find that were mainstream. But that makes sense also mm -hmm. because this is an international case. Like you had asked, the tent burned so fast that firefighters, they didn't have time to respond. All that was left by the time they arrived were chairs and tables burned down to their metal frames, charred bodies and clothing, and burned down wedding decorations. It was an awful scene. And the men were okay. Yes, the men were okay because there was no fire at the men's tent. So this was just women and children. After the fire settled down, officials began working to survey the scene to figure out how this happened. 
The fire was so hot that most of the bodies were burned beyond recognition, leading examiners to need dental records and DNA to identify most of the victims. Obviously, they had a list of wedding attendees, but it still was not clear who was who. And also, you don't know if someone did not attend, if they left early. So this was a lot of work to identify the victims as well. News broadcasts on the night of the fire stated that this was the worst tragedy that Kuwait had seen in 40 years. Was it initially thought, well, I'm assuming, first of all, his wife was not in the tent. She was not deceased. She made it. She survived. She was one of the survivors. She survived. Okay. Correct. Um, So my question was, I'm assuming it seems accidental at first, and then the story changes. Well, yeah, I think that they initially respond as if, though, this is an accidental fire, but they investigate and determine the true source. Unfortunately, too, uh, a few sources stated that the bride's mother and sister, along with seven of the family's children, were among those who perished in the fire. This was a true tragedy for everyone. You had asked about Azaid's wife. I believe at the time she was not in the tent. I think she was in the men's tent briefly. Um, I'm not sure what the reasoning Mm -hmm. was. You know, if it's the couple maybe stays in the men's tent, but she did Mm -hmm. um, escape the fire. And of course, the question that needs to be answered now was how did this fire begin? Was this an accident or was it intentional? Well, Amy, investigators quickly discovered that this was not an accidental fire that was set. And I could guess who said it. You probably can. They found gasoline had been burned around the whole perimeter of the tent. So this was very obvious. Someone had poured gasoline around the tent. But it was very hard for them at first to determine who would have wanted to cause such mass destruction and devastation. Both Saeed and his new bride were very well liked within the community. And everyone, by all accounts, or mostly everyone, was excited for their new union. The police began, obviously, by questioning survivors from the wedding and other family, friends and acquaintances associated with Saeed and his new wife. And like... And like the U.S., the Kuwaiti police started with those closest to the couple, which also included Zaid's first wife, Nasra. Now, even though Nasra never openly talked about her negative feelings about her husband's second wedding, she obviously talked to a couple of people, but she wasn't extremely vocal Investigators could tell immediately that something was off about her demeanor. Of just a few minutes of asking Nazra pretty routine questions, she broke down and confessed to the crime, stating that she wanted to ruin their wedding day as revenge for her husband abandoning her for his second wife. And she admitted to starting the fire. Perhaps she felt guilty. Maybe she didn't intend for it to get so out of control and for there to be so many victims. Yes, I I think that's a question that we can discuss later on. And I think it's a very significant question in this case. Some sources also state that Nasra may have wanted to, you know, pay back Zaid for possible abusive treatment of her. However, I could not find no evidence to support Nasra having been abused by Zaid or his family. That was just something that was and mentioned also, during an interview. She also likely would have targeted him if he was abusive to her, maybe. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, right. Why Why not mm-hmm. him? Why her family? Yeah, I, there, again, there was mm-hmm. no evidence to support that. So we, we, we don't ever know what goes on, though, behind closed doors. So mm-hmm. we'll just keep that as a caveat. However, since Nasra confessed so quickly, police arrested her on August 16th, 2009, just one day after this deadly wedding. And this is clearly a mass murder. I don't know if their definitions are similar in Kuwait, but this is a huge mass murder. And I would imagine their punishments are also different than here in the United States. Well, we'll get to that. Don't worry. I know you were, you, you want to know that. I promise we'll get there. Nasra was charged with premeditated and attempted murder and arson. And I do not believe that there was any offer of a plea deal in her case, Amy, just so you know. Nasra's trial was set to begin on October 27, 2009, in the Court of First Instance, which is similar to our criminal courts. However, Nasra was singing a very different tune in court than she did in the interrogation room. She now had legal counsel, which we know changes things. She obtained legal counsel after her arrest, and now, at the advice of her lawyers, she requests that her 
confession be redacted, stating that she was coerced into confessing by the officers who questioned her. So redacted means not being used. Do you know if it was videotaped? I don't know. I didn't see any evidence that it was, though, to be perfectly honest. Um, The court quickly denied her request and stated that her confession was valid and could be used in her trial. They found that there was no coercion. Remember, too, she confessed pretty quickly and it seemed to surprise officers. So I know you know a lot more about coerced confessions, and I'm sure it can happen quickly. But I would imagine that the it usually takes a little bit longer for people. Would that be pretty accurate? How long was her interrogation? They said just minutes into it, she broke down. It wasn't a long interrogation. All right. I mean, everyone's different. Okay. <laughs> also, remember, it's a different culture. Mm-hmm. And maybe she felt a sense of fear or intimidation True. that maybe we don't experience here. It's hard to say. That's true. Uh, just because there's no evidence of coercion does not mean that it didn't happen. And it doesn't mean that she didn't feel it. Uh, especially mm-hmm. dealing with the only relations I think that she had with men are dealing directly with her husband. And now she's in a room of law yep. enforcement males. So yes, it could definitely be a different scenario. Did she sign a confession? Because if it wasn't videotaped, I'm assuming they have to have some sort of proof of what she said. Sure. Yeah. Um, I believe it was yeah. signed. I, I can't say mm-hmm. that for sure, but I absolutely believe there okay. was a way to verify that okay. she made the confession. And I think her lawyer stipulated that she did make the confession. I don't think there okay. was any question that perhaps this never happened. The stakes were very high at her trial, Amy, because the prosecution was looking to sentence Nasra to death. And so were the bride and groom and all of the families affected by this tragedy. Let me explain a little bit about their role in the process, Amy. In Kuwait, families have a right to retribution, but they can waive that right if they want to, which basically means that even though the death penalty was on the table, the family could waive their right to the death penalty and opt for leniency in sentencing. But there was not one person, not one victim or family member of a victim that wished to waive that right. That's similar. It's a little more informal in the United States, but the prosecution often takes into account what the victim's family wants as well. Yes, that's absolutely correct. It's definitely more formalized, though. It's a right. Mm -hmm. It's a right of victims. They can waive it or not. It seemed, though, that everyone, including the public, they wanted Nasra to hang for her crimes. And that would be the death penalty there um, by hanging. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the trial went ahead with the death penalty as a possible outcome. But there was an interesting development, Amy, that would complicate the possible death sentence. During her Mm -hmm. stay in jail before her trial, similar to us, you know, there's a pretrial detention period. Nasra claimed that she was pregnant with Zaid's third child. Now, if this was actually the case, this would have worked in her favor because even though the death penalty is legal in Kuwait and was an option, it's illegal to sentence a pregnant woman to death in Kuwait. They could have just waited till she had the baby and then sentenced her. I'm not sure what the laws, the rules are following the birth either. There might have been a certain period of time. Also, they move quicker in their legal system. Okay. This was a complicating factor. But it would have worked in her favor and it would have been possibly a saving grace. However, pretty shortly after Nasra claimed that she miscarried the baby, but she said this was due to one of the officers in the prison who supposedly had a connection to Zaid having forced her to take medication that ended up aborting the baby. Any evidence of this? No. There's no evidence to support her pregnancy and there's no evidence to support this, which does not mean that it did not happen. Mm -hmm. This was another shocking turn of events. Mm -hmm. But was it true? Nasra's claim of pregnancy and miscarriage, as I said, it couldn't be proven by doctors or medical tests. But because it couldn't be substantiated and because she was not pregnant anymore, she was still eligible for the death penalty. Again, this could have been a last ditch effort to save her life or it could have been absolutely true. Do you know if their system is the same that one can plead guilty or they could choose? Do they have right to a trial? Um, Is she claiming that she didn't do anything or is she claiming that she did it, but she had some sort of mental illness? What is what's going on here? Right. She's going to trial because I do believe they're allowed to take a plea, but there is no plea that was being offered here. So Nasra has to go to trial and her story changes at trial. Her defense changes. So they're allowed to put on a defense similar to what we are. There was a lot of evidence brought against Nasra at trial, perhaps some stronger than others, but 
there was eyewitness testimony from people who knew Nasra and Zaid, uh, one of them including the pair's maid who claimed that she saw Nasra. The maid was invited to the wedding, um, mm -hmm. but she saw Nasra at the wedding and she saw her with a gasoline can. So that was very damaging. Mm hmm. Interestingly, her first confession, the one she asked for redacted, was not permitted at the trial. Somehow it was ruled to be inadmissible. But Nasra had subsequent confessions to her involvement with changing stories. So let me just recap this, OK, because she has a couple of different stories. Her first confession, as you recall, was that she set the fire to ruin the wedding, but just to ruin the wedding. Her second statement was that she was coerced and that she had no involvement in the fire. Remember, this is when she said the police officers mm -hmm. coerced her. Okay. Well, now at her trial, she had a third statement, and that was that she was, in fact, at the wedding, and she was responsible for the fire, but it was a complete accident. How so? Nasra said that she went to the wedding and that she poured a liquid around the women's tent but she stated that she believed this liquid was actually holy water. Now, and it was in a gas can. <laughs> it was it was in some type of can. So maybe the eyewitness mm -hmm. too. I'm not sure the eyewitness specifically said gasoline cans, but she saw Nasra okay. pouring something. But why holy okay. water? Well, she said the holy water was used to curse her husband's new marriage. I'm not sure how she would have mistaken gasoline, regardless of the can, for water. But this was the new claim, well, even though it was a little bit hard to believe. And she's claiming that she didn't set the fire. She poured the liquid, but she doesn't know how the fire ignited. No, she's saying that she did. She she realized afterwards that it was gasoline. She should have just kept to one of her first stories. This sounds a little ridiculous. I think so. I think this is a bad story. I'm, I'm actually surprised mm -hmm. they went forward with this claim. Uh, Nasra's defense team also tried to establish that she had a history of mental instability which contributed to poor decision-making. In addition, they used, or they tried to use Nasra's age as a mitigating factor, claiming that she was too young to know the severity of her actions, being just 23 years old at the time. Okay, that's a bit of a stretch. It is. They're begging for leniency uh, due to the fact that she's a woman, due to the fact that she had a history of mental instability, and the fact they said that it would be very heinous for the Kuwaiti government to sentence a young mother to death, a young woman okay. who was a mother. <music> Unfortunately, the news story and all of the mitigating factors did not work in Nasra's favor. The truth was that the majority of Kuwaiti people saw Nasra as an evil young woman. And it's a term evil we don't like to use very often. But in this case, that is how she was perceived as having just this vengeful uh, crime. This is why she perpetrated it. She wanted to inflict pain on her husband and his new wife. And she was a woman who was evil and full of revenge. Why target innocent women and children? You know, not that she should have harmed anyone, mm -hmm. but right. we would think maybe the new wife would have been the target. It it seems strange to me that she targeted all these innocent people. I think she probably believed the wife was in the tent. Yeah. However, that depends on what you believe her intent was. Now, I don't know if the jury felt very much if they adhered to the facts or they just also agreed that this was a, a vengeful young woman. It's hard to tell if this was fact motivated. I'd like to think so, or also motivated by these strong feelings that most of... Mm -hmm. Uh, Kuwaiti people had felt at the time. But either way, on March 30th, 2010, after six months of hearing evidence, Nasra was found guilty of her crimes and she was sentenced to hang. I believe the evidence was very strong against her. So the jury probably was going based on all the evidence that was presented to them. Now, Nasra was only the eighth woman in Kuwait history to ever receive the death penalty. And in fact, she was the first Kuwaiti woman to receive a sentence of death. Oh, wow. Yes, there's a chivalry in the Kuwaiti system similar to the one that we probably have in ours. Women usually gain more sympathy and receive much lighter sentences, but Nasr did not receive that because of the scale and the nature of her crime. It was simply too horrendous and it caused too many deaths. 
So the chivalry that women might receive, Nasra just did not extend. I'm curious what their appeal system is like. They have an appeal system. I don't believe it goes for as long as our system can go for, because after just close to seven years, uh, Nasra was hanged. She was executed on January 25th, 2017. So I think their system moves a little faster than ours, as do most it's systems. It's not that much faster. I well, think the, the average the time awaiting time checked, death row is more than six to seven years in the United States. It's, a, it's about a decade, maybe up to 12, 14, depending. But yeah, I guess you're right. That's almost double. It's at least a decade up to, yeah, 12 yeah. to 14 years would be more average. So I do believe their system moves faster. Now, it could be just that they move it quicker or they have less appeals. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get into the complexities of the appeals process, but mm -hmm. they do have one. Nasra's death was not surprising to many people in Kuwait, as well as many people around the world. However, there are certainly those that think her death and the deaths of so many people around them could have been avoided by re-examining the practice of polygamy. So I just want to briefly discuss polygamy as a practice, and you can let me know what you think. In the United States, polygamy is illegal in all states, but in some states, there's less of a punishment. So in Utah, for example, where it's probably most prevalent, uh, polygamy is treated as a minor infraction, which is punishable by a misdemeanor. And in the United States, it's really left to the state's to discretion to decide how polygamy will be punished. Taking this to the international scene, according to the Pew Center for Research, 2% of the world's population lives in polygamous households, though polygamy is also banned in many countries. The United Nations Human Rights Committee has stated that polygamy violates the dignity of women and has called for the abolishment of polygamy in all countries. Now, polygamy appears to be most widespread, the numbers will dictate this, in sub-Saharan Africa, where the numbers of polygamous households really start up in the 20% and higher. Though many of the places where polygamy is legal are also Muslim majorities. Even in some of these countries, though, the practices can be very rare, with the exception of, I would say, Kuwait. It's, Kuwait seems to have a higher rate of polygamous marriages than many other similar countries. The numbers that I could find in recent years were that Kuwait has about 8% of marriages being polygamous. This was one statistic I found as of 2015. I also found another statistic, though, that said it was about 5.5%. So just know that I think this number probably lies somewhere in the middle between 5.5% of 8% of marriages being polygamous, which I said is a little bit higher than similarly situated countries. Do most of these polygamous relationships have two wives or it's upwards of three, four? Is there an average yeah. number? No, no, the two, three, four. Um, I would say probably more than two wives uh, from what I saw. Mm -hmm. So it's not uncommon for uh, the men to have, and it's not multiple husbands, as you said, right? It's multiple wives. It's not uncommon for men to have multiple wives. So while some places are very accepting of polygamous practices and where it's common, one of the things that I wondered about and just did a little digging into is what are the consequences or the potential consequences of polygamous practices? Well, research shows that women in these relationships have significantly higher rates of loneliness, depression, and anxiety, as well as higher rates of feeling fearful and much lower self-esteem compared with counterparts not involved in polygamous relationships. What about rates of domestic violence? Yeah. Are they so higher? I found mixed statistics on that, to be perfectly honest. So I did find some rates uh, that indicate it was higher and others where it was not. Um, so it was kind of without doing a much deeper dive on that, I wouldn't be comfortable saying mm -hmm. in all polygamous, you know, cultures, there's a higher rate of domestic violence. But there's definitely a feeling that there is one partner and usually the male who is in control and has the control and has mm -hmm. the power. So you might equate that in its own as some form of domestic violence or not. Yeah. Um, I think this this uh, these effects are exacerbated again when women are not equal in selecting these relationships. And again, they are not the priority partner. They are not in control. Do we know what effect it has on children? No, I, that's a really great question, Amy. That's not something that I looked into for this episode, but that would be also an important question. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that it impacts male and female children differently. 
to be honest, mm-hmm. especially with the way they are raised. Yeah. If we frame this issue in this light, should we feel any, I don't know, sympathy for Nasra? We could be compassionate to an offender while still thinking they deserve punishment. Sure. Yeah. No, right? I, like, I agree. It's clear that, yeah, she probably wasn't in a great situation. Does that excuse what she did? Of course not. In addition to the issue of polygamy, other scholars have used Nasra's case to criticize the treatment of women in Kuwait and the stigmatization of mental health issues that still persist. It was very hard to know how strong of a mitigating factor Nasra's mental health would have been because we don't know the extent of her issues, but there does tend to be less sympathy, and this is probably regardless of the country, for a perpetrator who has mental health issues when there's a violent premeditated crime Mm -hmm. with many victims, especially victims that include children. So I don't think this was very surprising, Kuwait or another country. She wasn't medicated or she was never diagnosed formally? I don't know if she was diagnosed formally. Again, she had a history, a documented history. Does that mean Mm -hmm. she received a diagnosis or there was just a recording of some issues? I don't know to what extent. Mm -hmm. I don't believe she received any treatment from what I know. And I would assume there was no like court assessment, mental health assessment, or if so, maybe they didn't find anything. Okay. That's correct. There was not. And there was not a clear argument either for, let's say, insanity where we might have, which is a legal term, but did not seem to be anything extreme enough to make that kind of argument. I mean, in the end, Nasr's actions were beyond shocking to the Kuwaiti people. Kuwait is a relatively peaceful country with very low crime rates, and women are not commonly the perpetrators. So for a woman to cause the deaths of 57 women and children, injuring 90 more, was really horrifying to the Kuwaiti people. One of the few silver linings to come out of this case was that they did change some of the laws, not around mental health, but around the use of the celebration tents. Remember I stated that this tent was not up to code. Mm -hmm. A lot of people could have been saved if there was multiple exits. So now they all need to be up to code, which means they have to have more than one exit and their safety needs to be certified before use. I would have liked to see some policy regarding providing mental health services to women in polygamous relationships. but So would I, uh, to be honest. But from what I could gather, that was not one of the outcomes here. Okay. Now that we do have the legal outcomes, let's turn to discuss the causes of this crime. I want to begin with the obvious and kind of work from there. Nasra was very upset and dismayed that her husband found another wife. And this part is understandable, even if it was culturally acceptable. That doesn't mean that Nasra accepted this. The feelings produced are similar to infidelity. Um, You feel betrayed, loss, fear, depression, anxiety. These are very serious consequences. So I don't think it was a big surprise that Nasra felt this way. But she was also very young. It did not appear that she had strong or healthy coping mechanisms. I think she felt overburdened with her children. And so I think that just the stress and the frustration erupted into this awful act of brutality. Ultimately, I think the strain was just too much for her. It also sounds like there was a lack of social bonds, at least that we're aware of. Yeah, I think so as well. It didn't sound like her... You know, it's possible that she didn't feel a strong attachment to her husband if he worked a lot and that she didn't have other family members close by. Um, It just sounds like she was home a lot. And I'm sure that didn't help her mental health. I don't think so. Feelings of isolation led to further stress and inability to cope with losing. She also believed, even though her husband wasn't leaving her, that's what she believed, that he was abandoning her. Here's the question that we have to ask. You had said, why target the guests? Did she mean for the guests to actually die? I'm not sure. I think she meant to ruin the wedding and legitimately burning the wedding down. Mm -hmm. But did she actually foresee the consequence that burning the tent would mean burning all the people inside of it? I would hope not. I'm not sure. I would hope not. Because then that is, you know, I, we don't like to use the word evil, but if you really intend to harm that many women and children, I would, if I had to bet, she probably wanted to ruin the wedding, like you said, probably didn't maybe mm-hmm. think or care, have enough regard for human life to think that far into it, which that's where the problem lays, is that she didn't have the foresight. Exactly. She has to, though, as we know, I think similar to our legal system, 
you have to have the foresight to understand the consequences of that kind of action mm -hmm. would have led to um, the death and the kind of destruction. So it, it is unclear whether or not she did intend to burn all those victims and kill all those victims. On the other hand, also, I heard some denial of responsibility in Nasra's defense. She didn't mean to burn down the tent. She didn't realize it was gasoline. So neutralization theory popped into my head, too. Is she attempting to neutralize her guilt by denying responsibility or denying the actions? Did well, you hear that a little bit or no? It's hard to know if she really believes that or if she's just using that as a way to right. get leniency in the court. If she truly believes those things, then yes, I think that's a great illustration of neutralization theory. But I'm thinking that she's just doing anything to save herself, saying anything she could to possibly save herself. Sure. Also, in the end, one of the factors that we had discussed as contributing was the second marriage. And, and really, this is goes to the polygamous practice. Um, very interestingly, I just want to point out, I did a little research. In a recent survey, it was found that Kuwaiti men, over 94%, are happily married with one wife. So there seems to be a stronger satisfaction with keeping one-on-one -on -one relationships and a changing dynamic in Kuwaiti in terms of uh, traditional use of polygamy. Now, of course, it's it, there's no way to know if Nasra would have perpetrated violence without this impetus. Uh, she had some of the factors and the red flags for possible deviant behavior, you might say. But I suspect that no act would have been as egregious or as disastrous if her husband had one had been one of those men surveyed who was a happily married man to just one woman. Yeah, I I'm hoping that her two young children are with her or with what's his name? I'm sorry, Yazareth. Zaid. Zaid. I'm hoping that her two young children are with Zaid and his new wife because this is very traumatic for them as well. They lost their mother. I thought about that as well. Yeah. Oh, yes. Losing their mother, family members, mm -hmm. the the being reported on in the media. Very, very traumatic for the children involved here. The last thing I want to discuss in today's episode is Nasra's punishment. Usually we discuss whether the system worked. I think in this case, we'd both agree that the correct perpetrator was caught, prosecuted and convicted. The question comes down to whether or not you agree that the death penalty was appropriate. Now, just um, a couple of statistics for comparative purposes from Kuwait to United States. In Kuwait, as I said, death penalty is very rare for women. It's also used significantly less for women in the United States. Females who are arrested for these crimes as well, for the crimes of murder in the U.S., typically have no prior criminal history, uh, possibly no prior offenses at all. They are often, but not always, domestic situations motivated by emotion or profit. So that is similar. Currently in the United States, we have 50 women on death row. That's been um, the same number for a number of years now. Since the late 1600s, 1700s, over 500 women have been executed. But since 1976, the number of women executed in the United States is just 17. So we do use the punishment less for women. Mm -hmm. I guess you might say in some regard that makes us somewhat more chivalrous mm -hmm. towards women when it comes to the death penalty. And Kuwait has a very similar yeah, reputation. There's also, there's also a big difference in probably the heinous nature of the crimes, the aggravated factors present in cases of women perpetrators versus male perpetrators. Absolutely. Now, Amy, I know in general you're not a proponent of the death penalty. Um, I have mixed feelings about mm -hmm. it, but I just wonder in the context of this crime, and given what you know, what your opinion would be on the punishment, was justice served? There is no way for justice to be served when you have such a heinous act and so many lives lost. This right. might be an unpopular opinion, but I'm not sure that the death penalty was the right move. Here, I think mm -hmm. life without parole would have been just fine. In this situation, um, she could have remained in contact with her children, so that would have been good for them. Also, I don't know that that would be the practice. I don't yeah. know that she would have been cut off from her. I suspect that she would have been cut off from her children. Yeah, I guess so. Um, the the only problem that I have here, as you as you mentioned, I'm 99 percent against the death penalty. Very rarely do I think it's appropriate. In this case, the reason I don't think it's appropriate is because we don't have proof beyond a reasonable doubt that she intended to kill people. I think she just made a really right. bad decision. I think it's possible things. Right. I don't. I don't know that she 
saw that that as a potential outcome. I don't know if she sure. had the education to know how flammable the substance was. Maybe she thought it would yeah. just ignite the outside of the tent and it would just make people run around, you know. So I don't know. The, I, I'm struggling with, you know, the intention here. Yeah, very tough. I agree. Now, you could ask different people. So was justice served? I guess that depends on who you ask for retribution mm -hmm. or retributive purposes, uh, the will of the victims and for the families. Yes, mm -hmm. they might say justice was served. For the family of Nasra, her children, and all those who are perhaps suffering some of the negative impacts of polygamous relationships, the answer might be a different one. Mm -hmm. In the end, this is a very complicated issue, certainly with cultural variations when it comes to feelings, customs, and laws, mm -hmm. but I think certainly a case that was worth exploring on today's episode. I know you learned a lot, Amy. Yeah, it's <laughs> reminding me how much I want to do more international cases, and I have to be honest, the reason I shy away from them is often because I cannot find enough information to put it into a full episode because sometimes the information is in other languages, and when you translate it, sometimes things are lost in translation, um, but I'm going to yeah. start upping those on my list a little bit because they are really interesting. I think you've done a pretty good job. I think we both try, and yes, they're challenging, but very rewarding in the end. Yeah. That's it for today, and we look forward to hearing everyone's thoughts on this case. Uh, I'm sure there will be some mixed feelings, yep. but we always welcome the discussion yes. and the feedback. So we appreciate you joining us today, and we hope to catch you next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer is James Varga. Script editing is by Abigail Bel Castro. Audio editing is by Siler Burr and Jose Alfonso. And music is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to follow and leave a review. You can also support the show through Patreon, where you can get access to additional ad-free content such as exclusive full-length episodes, lectures, a book club, and virtual happy hours with Megan and Amy. For more information, visit patreon.com slash women and prime. Sources for today's episode include The Gulf News, Britannica.com, Kuwait, CapitalPunishment.org, the journal BMC Pregnancy and Childbirth, the Pew Center for Research, Medium.com, The New Arab, and Coffeehouse Crimes on YouTube.